What's going on everybody? Peter Martin here. Welcome to the Jazz Piano Method. Welcome to this week's lesson. I'm so excited that you are here and I'm so happy to be here. It is presently the end of 2020, a very strange year that I think a lot of people want to put behind them. So if you're watching it still at the end of 2020, watching this lesson, or if you're watching this in the future, that's kind of where we're at. But I always feel like it's a great time to dive into this wonderful instrument, the piano. Not just this one. This is a wonderful one, but your piano, this piano, a keyboard, whatever. The 88s, you know, uh, and, and to learn something. And, and if you're going through a tough time now, you know, let's take this time during this lesson and this communing over music to just kind of put everything out, else out, and just sort of block out the world. You know, like you put up those, uh, those shades, the, the light block out, and let's just focus in on this. And then it could be any year, it could be any time, anything could be happening in the world, because we're gonna be in our own little world. Um, so, what are we talking about this? We are talking about the whys and the hows of practicing bass lines. And um, I've done some lessons in the past on this, and you guys know I'm pretty passionate about bass lines, but I still get a lot of questions about it, and I think it's an area that we need to be revisiting, uh, checking back in constantly and consistently as we progress as jazz pianists. Because there's so many, well, let's talk about because, because I, that's why I said the why. You know, a lot of times we jump right into how to practice bass lines, how to play bass lines, how to use them over different types of tunes. But if we understand why we're doing it, sometimes we can kind of up our motivation, especially when things get a little bit difficult. And bass lines can be hard. That's why a lot of people shy away from them, at least to do it well because we're developing all this improvisation and fun stuff with the right hand, and here comes the left hand. Now we gotta do some interesting things with that hand. Who's, who's gonna get our full attention, right? So we kind of go to the dominant hand usually. But as far as the why, the first big reason I think is that it can give us such a great um, element to pull out in our solo piano playing. So if we're always playing trio, and we've got a bass player. So I can imagine that bass, and if the bass player was actually here playing it, even better. But it's like we're playing in that 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 um, very typical trio style, which is great. A lot of rootless voicings and stuff. We're not even thinking about bass lines and it's not getting in the way. But if we want to play solo piano, at times it's nice to... Even if we leave that... coming back to it or we're just playing it constantly just to be able to bring that element in and this is just the walking bass line we're going to talk about several different kinds of bass line but the concept is the same pull them in when you don't have a bass player not necessarily to duplicate what a bass would do but to duplicate the feel and the foundation that the bass player would be providing and so that's when you get into that kind of solo piano playing and it's really I mean even if you're playing a ballad you know that kind of playing that starts to get into the area where it's like, wow, I'm listening to the pianist and I'm not missing the bass. I might hear things that are evocative of the bass, but I'm not feeling like, wow, he sounds like he's playing with a trio that doesn't exist, you know? So that's sort of the first reason of why we need to be practicing bass lines. But the more interesting things, like that's sort of the utility of why we practice bass lines, the usage, like how we're going to pull into our playing. But these next two areas, I think, are really more important, and especially in terms of our development. And if you can kind of buy into these areas, I think it can become a fun and effective part of your ongoing practice routine because you'll understand why you're doing it and what the benefits are. And that's first to develop independence of the hands. Practicing bass lines is the easiest way in line with actually playing music 
to, to either start to develop your hand independence or more likely to continue and start to take you to that next level of hand independence. That's something that we always need to be practicing on. It's, it's nothing that you ever get perfect at. It's always trying to get to that point where the hands can truly operate independently. And so what happens is, like if we take that F blues that I played earlier, and I'm gonna do it starting out over a two feel. One, two, three, four. So this is just a simple half notes, simple bass line. I'm playing it by itself. So I'm working on a bass line, right? But I'm not really working on independence of the hands because only one hand is playing. So then I'm going to slowly add in some elements. Just simple comping. I'm already now working on my hand independence. And the trick is to slowly build this up. Rhythmically, harmonically, I mean, we haven't even gotten to melodies yet, but we're not going beyond what we can do without messing up the bass line. So that's what the barometer is. We're building the opposite of what we normally do where, where the right hand is kind of driving things in terms of the left hand is fitting in whenever it can without messing up what's happening in the right hand. This we're shifting over. The left hand is the melodic driver because a bass line, very important to think about, even as these simple half notes, restricted bass lines are still melodic entities. It's a line, right? And you think about the great ba bass players, they're really interesting lines, right? So back to the half notes. That's the beginning of that hand independence. And the great thing about this is, you can always practice this and you can show yourself if you've got that independence at the level that you're trying to play. Because if you fall off of those half notes, alter the rhythm, you know you've gone beyond what you can handle. But if you're right underneath, that's fine. You're challenging yourself enough. And your real barometer is, are you staying within the groove? Are you dropping beats? That kind of a thing. Now, you may need to record yourself as you're doing this, but if you build up slowly, you'll probably be okay. And so that's really starting with the simplest voicings you need to and the simplest rhythms, and then trying to hear slightly more complicated rhythms, but still uh, this is with the right hand, still not getting melodic yet. Then, you know, you'll start to add in maybe a melody that you know. And if you find yourself going... So that sounds pretty good, but I'm not being independent with my hands because I'm leaving those half notes in the left hand, which for a performance situation is fine, but for practicing hand independence is not. So we'll get into more of that lately. Uh, a little later, but the main thing is just to really understand that practicing bass line is the easiest, most effective, and actually the most fun way to practice hand independence. I can give you a bunch of different, um, you know, well, finger independence and hand independence exercises that are wonderful, um, but if they're not pieces of music, or they don't have some kind of creativity, they're just exercises, they're not gonna be as fun for you. So this is one that can very much be graded based upon how you practice it and just your concentration level is really the only thing. Um, and then the, the last area of why we practice bass lines and why this can be so important um, for your development is to start to get some melodic um, conception and melodic possibilities happening with your left hand. I find that much for the hand independence, it's the best way to practice is using bass lines. Same thing for getting your left hand to start playing melodically. And a lot of times we think about that in terms of counterpoint. So it might be. Um, where it's like two separate melodies either in between or on top of each other. Um, but still kind of like the way a bass player would play and then the way a horn player would play. But a lot of things that I know a lot of you want to get into playing like, um, you know.
kind of left hand melodic movement in the middle that's actually in that middle of the three zones, bass kind of root area, mid zone, and then up here, that you would think, okay, that's not a bass line, right? But if you're practicing playing bass lines, the hand independence and the finger independence, and just using your left hand, using your brain to control your left hand in a melodic way, that's the beginning to being able to play melodies up here, actually. <clears throat> and there's some like neurological science. If we have any neuro, neuro, neurologists uh, as members, feel free to like chase this down in the study because I think it'd be interesting. But I know in terms of how our brain controls the different hands, especially the dominant hand, which for most people is the right hand, 90% of the humans, I guess, um, versus how we control what's happening in the left hand, we have to train the non-dominant hand to operate in the way that comes more naturally to our dominant hand. So this is just the easiest way, even when you're doing those half notes, you're practicing melodies. And when we get into some of the other stuff in a, in a minute, we're really gonna be practicing melodies and, and technically and conceptually from our brain, how to control that left hand in a melodic way, okay? So that's the, the, um, the why, why we practice bass lines. Um, let's talk about how to practice, okay? The first thing is simplify and isolate. So important always. And we've already looked at the best way to do that over the blues is start with that half note. So the concept of simplifying and isolate in this context is we're playing the minimum um, and most simple way of playing a bass line that we can do continuously without any kind of alteration. So it's the beginning of kind of automating what needs to happen there. So it doesn't mean that you're gonna start here and not make some mistakes or mess up the rhythm or drop a beat, but you're gonna be able to hear it easier when it's simple like that. And like I said, we're starting very simple in the right hand too. Really listening for those details. And thinking about that melodic movement up there. So it's a challenge when you just have these half notes to create a melody because things like, even when we start to go to four, which is the next place you would typically go, you've got more notes to play with. So it's harder you know, not to slip up, but to create a melody, you've got more notes to shape that melody. working on the bass line, you're going to put more attention to this. If you mess up and don't play a great improvised thing, or if you just, if that's all you can do, no problem, because you're really trying to get this going. And for these, I'm not going to have time this week to go through every concept on this, you know, but this is the kind of stuff, and you'll see it in the transcription here, um, that if you like some of this stuff, you can just learn this. Like with quarter notes and half notes, it's very easy to look at the transcription and start to see kind of where I'm going with these things. And none of this stuff is things that I made up. This is all stuff I sold from Percy Heath transcriptions and Ron Carter and Christian McBride and Ray Brown, all the great Paul Chambers, you know, Jimmy Garris, all the great bass players that you know. Um, and also, you know, Oscar Peterson, if you like doing this half note, um, check out Sandy Blues, Sandy's Blues. And especially the way he starts to mix it up going between four and two. And that's kind of like, you know, obviously it's Oscar Peterson. It's top level technically and stuff. It's not necessarily something that most people can jump right into, but it's that kind of inspiration you can get for what you can do as far as actually applying these bass lines eventually into your playing, okay? Um, so we talked about that, and remember, we, and we've got this just shells and basic three note voices too you can start with before you even wanna go melodic in your right hand. If you're having a challenge of keeping those bass lines going and getting interesting things, just start with that. And then when you go to the melody, a real simple one maybe. And then, you know, don't get bored or stuck on this, just the blues, or you can go to different keys, but still simplify and isolate. You know? And 
this is also where you really learn to play in the time because you've got that baseline barometer, whether you're So all that stuff I was playing, playing over just this requires the same concentration if you want to get to that with the same feel. So let me slow this down. Just half notes. So it's very important to get that same feel. Okay, so I see somebody's asking, but what notes though? Yes, well that's a very interesting thing, and I'm not gonna be able to give them all to you, but you're gonna see in the transcription a bunch of them here. Um, the general concept, and the reason I like doing this over a blues so much, you know, as always, transcribing these in a little bit, you know, from, like I would recommend uh, Bag's Groove, Percy Heath's solo, uh, bass lines on there. He's doing a great two feel and a great walking four. Very easy to hear. We'll have a link below as we always do to that recording. There's two versions of it too. They're both great. Um, that's a great way to just learn specific lines and start to get them, you know, automated in here. But on the blues, we're always thinking about the chords. So if we think about F7 and then B flat seven, and then back to F7, that's the first four bars, right? One bar F, one bar B flat, two bars of F. So we've got two notes at the half note to get to B flat. So what are our choices? Or one, two, or. But which one sounds the best? That one doesn't quite, it doesn't quite work great, does it? Because it makes it sound like it wants to go. You know, these, putting these bass lines together is very much like connecting the dots. You remember the, the, the game, the, the, the written game. If you got all four, you can do that, or you can go. Or you can go. But with the two, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Your one and your five is going to be your starting point. If you're not sure what to play, play one and five, especially over at blues. But also, like, if you do... All the things you are, so you might just do one and five to start. I messed up. So this is all half notes, just one and five. And again, if this is all too much to do, these, these extra stuff just... Maybe get that metronome going on two and four. If you can't do it with the right hand, just put the left hand and then add that in. Okay? Um, so that's F blues. We've done enough blues. Blues is great though. You can go through all the different keys. Let's talk about ballads next because this is an area that a lot of people um, skip over because they think, oh, ba uh, ballads don't have bass lines. Yes, they do. And they're really important because what we were talking about earlier for solo piano applications, this I think is one of the hippest places to add in actual bass lines. Like I'm much more likely to do a walking, a walking ballad bass line, at least for part of a tune over like, you know, Misty. Similar to what a bass player. than I would over like a straight walking four um, over. I would, I would very rarely play that. that. I mean, some people will do that and it's, it's fine. But I think over a ballad, um, it's just great because we can actually use it easier in a more interesting way, I think. And it's also easier to practice because everything's slowed down. The general concept is the same, but we have more time because it's ballad tempo. So if we look at same concept, one to five. Wait, let me 
make it in a better ballad feel. I'm, I'm going back to the other feel because it's in my ears now. So when you think about walking ballad, there's two different concepts, basic concepts, fundamental concepts. There's thousands of concepts. Every individual has them. But two different starting points. One is two. And these are quarter notes. One, two, three, four. Where it's based on an underlying triplet, eighth note triplet. So it'd be one, two. if you're not always playing it, that's kind of the feel. And then there's that straight eighth note feel. You hear the difference? Here's the straight eighth note. And here's the triplet. Nah, that's not right. Triplet. That's typically how you'll hear it. again so you should practice both of them and a simplify and isolate way to do it is to just practice one or the other at one time so maybe one course of the eighth note feel walking baseline feel and then one of the straight eighth note walking baseline feel in practical use you can jump back and forth and you do and that becomes kind of a part of the style and you can look at great bass players how they approach this they're not even thinking which one, they, it's just both kind of areas that they can, they can go to. But it's a very good way to have some sort of discipline practice. So if we look at Misty, E flat major. And I'm gonna extend out slightly as we practice our bass line, and we're gonna do straight eighth notes for this first part. Um, one, five, and instead of just five, one, five, again, I'm gonna go one, five, step above diatonically where I'm going. That's a great way to put a bass line together. Simple but effective. So it's all E flat major, and now B flat minor seven. Uh, one to five. And then the next chord, E flat seven, one to five. One, five. Step above diatonically. So just those two concepts, check it out. Here's the eighth note. You don't have to add it in every time. Just add it in when you hear it. And that becomes very much a connecting the dots. So we're going A flat major to D flat seven. I've got one beat. I'm going to add in the eighth notes because I'm practicing just those kind. And I'm going to E flat. So how do I connect the dots? D natural. So it's A flat major, D flat seven, back to the E flat major. Same thing. You'll notice I'm playing, these chords are very much half notes along with the walking uh, ballad feel. This is really good practice to get going, but I'm not really practicing hand independence. We talked about how important that is for bass lines, but that's because I'm getting into it. Once you can do that, you want to start doing, you want to start decoupling the hand. So it might be with soloing. You want to think about playing things that are simple but are not together with the left hand. And over ballads, one of the easiest ways to do this after you start to get acclimated to being able to play these lines is to not think as strictly rhythmically with your right hand. You hear I'm, st I'm playing pretty much straight within the right hand it's just kind of free and in order to start to develop this you have to consciously not play together with both the hands this has to be rock solid but if I'm going so I'm gonna go I'll play a line that goes into the sec the next bar and I'm gonna hit one with the left hand with the bass line but with the right hand I'm gonna finish my line a little bit after one Try an eighth note in the left hand. Now I'm gonna try an eighth note triplet. I'm gonna wait a minute. Mm -hmm. 
So you can kind of just go through and challenge yourself like this. You've got those basic elements, and what we're doing is we're trying to execute them with the left hand. And I'm actually not thinking as much as the right hand. It might have sounded like I was because I was playing more notes, but that was just kind of stuff, you know. Um, because as we practice to get great bass lines, I mean, look, when you go, when you go to play in this stuff... float back to thinking about hearing what's coming out of your right hand more than the left hand, and that's okay, because that's natural, and um, you know, we want to kind of be hearing everything, and you will once you start making the connections and doing more things together and that overlap, but you don't want to be fighting against thinking about the dominant hand and, and, and what a lot of your melodic improvisation is going to be happening, but you want to be able to kind of secondarily almost in an automated way, not in a, I sound automated, but in a way where it can just kind of take on a mind of its own, to have the left hand to have that kind of creativity. So that's what really we're practicing when we practice these bass lines. So you don't want it to just be a thoughtless, just kind of like, oh, I'm just doing this because I have to play a bass line. You want to really be thinking about it melodically. That's why the right hand has to be sublimated in your thought process as you're doing this kind of practice. All right, so that's ballads. We talked about blues and really just kind of swing stuff in general you know, like the, all the things you are, the things that would be two feel uh, in a 4-4 situation or walking bass line. Now let's talk about groove tunes because this is a great area to kind of go in another direction, have some fun, and just like with the ballads, really get some stuff that you can use uh, effectively for solo piano to start to take you to the next level where, you know, you can do gigs and people are like, oh, we don't need to hire anybody else but the piano player. And man, it's grooving. People could even dance, maybe. Like, you're really being the whole orchestra. We talk about, we can be the big band. We can be the funk band. We can be the orchestra. We can be any ensemble rep representing it with the power of this instrument. But the reality of doing that is a lot. It's a lot. So how do we start to do that? Bass lines is a big part of it. All right, so I'm thinking like groove tunes. Could be any kind of groove, but ballad or swing, because we cover those. The classic Herbie Hancock. Chameleon. Okay, this can be such a great exercise because the simplify and isolate concept is already built in. And I know what you're thinking. Whoa, I've tried that, that's really hard. I didn't say it wasn't hard, but it's simp it is simple and you are gonna be isolating, working on independence of the hands and working on that melodic flair of your left hand. So it's only two chords. We're not worried about chord changes and a form and everything. And it's only two lines. The rhythm, the rhythm of it has some, some nuanced complexity, right? One, two, three. Upbeats. So you want to hit that precision. And you got to figure out something to do in the right hand that's not going to mess it up. Start easy. Mm. Mm, that's hard. So basically, I just took that simple rhythm, then I was like, let me take it up a notch. I did it a little too early. Let me shift it over one beat. But you can do. That's working on independence. Uh, right, let me concentrate here. One, two, three.
Okay, so when I say let me concentrate there, I had a little improvement. I was not concentrating on this. What I meant was let me concentrate on this baseline and make sure I can kind of nail that. Now, I, I slipped up on it a little bit, which is okay. You want to challenge yourself as you practice. As long as you can do it, I think, without dropping a beat. And, 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 and this gets into a little bit more advanced stuff, but it's not as far away from a lot of you than you may think. So this is good. We're going into 2021, so let's challenge ourselves. A lot of the times, like being able to get yourself out of a sticky situation in solo piano is just as important as getting yourself into a sticky situation. So if I'm doing... And I'm like, uh-oh, what did I do with the left hand? Think about coming into at that one. Forget about the... And the I already missed all that. Like keep that internal... Uh, Reset, right? I had to skip a lot there. That's okay, but I came in right. I did it again. Okay, and now, don't jump in trying to do all this at the beginning. You don't need to. To get the benefits of this, remember we talk about the process. Just get the bass line first and get it really accurate. And if you're like, I've got that, then add in just a single line. Same rhythm, one more note. up it takes some time um, sets and reps sets and reps are super important on this um, and then you know you can change this up there's a lot of different areas I think you know if you think about kind of a well not really a similar groove but Stevie Wonder's I can't help it I mean similar I was thinking similar because it's just two chords I mean goes to more later Baseline. And you can practice like. Ah, let's see. Ooh. So it's simpler. Remember, it's anything that's not right with the bass line, but it's in the groove. Like what you want to avoid, except at the very, very beginning, is. I don't mean avoid playing this, it sounds fine, but at practicing, because we're playing. We're coming in rhythmically together, so we're not really working getting the independence going. When you need to do that at the beginning, no problem. But anything, any kind of anything you can do that keeps that line going, and you play something else in the right hand. It's the talking that really throws it over the edge for me. So you heard that I messed that up, but I kept it in the groove. So I can tell this is something I need to practice because I was starting to lose some independence there. Which look, is not the end of the world. That can actually lead to some creative things. But we do want to be disciplined, I think, when we practice because again, the, the, the why we practice this, it's not just being able to play this stuff. Yes, that's, that's a benefit of the practice, is that you can pull this stuff out when it sounds good. And I love pulling out these kind of bass lines much more than... I just, I don't know why, but just for me, I would much rather play these kind of like grooves. I love playing over that, that, that thing, but I'm, I'm much more likely to not actually play the line, even solo piano. I don't know. But that process, I mean, what a pretty melody. And what's that going to lead to with your left hand? Like if you're playing. Remember we talked about how it's teaching your left hand to play melodically? And these are great because they're written out. I mean, they're written out. They're composed bass lines like...
like, so what, you know? Um, other grooves you can think about, um, yeah, kind of like, you know. I love coming up with these. They're like, they're really just all stolen from the meters. George Porter, you can go on and listen to any of, any, anything that they do, you know. kind of stuff. So if we're over a G, which is going to be an easy key to start these in, I literally make them up different every time. to go to it's like it's James Brown up in here but basically you're just coming up with a line and again you might be starting out start simple this is about the groove executing that melody within the groove with the left hand and slowly adding on to the right hand if you're playing in anything in the right hand that's not rhythmically in line with the left hand, you're working on hand independence, which is great. Um, you know, they got stuff, you know, some of the other stuff the meters have in G that's really cool. build up the lines based on this. That's uh, not a pocky way. What is that? I don't remember. Look at Pi Pi. All the meters tunes are great. Great titles. Um, And then, okay, other grooves that we're thinking about. How about something in six or three, whatever this is, all blues. That's one of the great bass lines. Everyone talks about, which is great. The piano audio's clipping. I was getting excited, sorry. I got excited on the, on the meters. That always clips it out. Um, yeah, everyone always talks about the so what, but I think that's a great bass line too. And if you can learn to just play the melody with that bass line. Even before you get to that, maybe, so you don't get discouraged, learn just the bass line, of course, but. And then simple, maybe three note voicings. And then your only requirement on this would be to not play them together. Play it somewhere simple, but not at the same time. Footprints, someone's saying. That's another good one. Yeah, I mean, the, these kind of tunes are just so good. They have written bass lines to get, get your left hand rolling. Um, and then the last area I have for us to think about, I mean, so many areas when you talk about bass lines, um, I mean, you know. That's kind of 
kind of a baseline. That's really like what we're talking about, the melodic stuff with your left hand. There's a whole world there. We're not going to get into the classical today. Um, but no, the last area I wanted to talk about is an effective bass line over a Brazilian bossa nova groove. So um, maybe starting slow. Um, and these are simple because where you really want to start is just a half note. You're not, we're not doing all that. No. This is where it's at. So with that half, ooh, I added in that note there. So what I was trying to do, I almost made it just half notes, even when you want to. We're going to add that later, but that simplify and isolate, get that independence going. Man, it's so fun. And then this over the bossa nova, it's a little easier for some people to find those different rhythmic places because it's developing those upbeats that we need. Think about the guitar. Think about a guitarist on Impanema Beach in Rio. It's summer down there. And the bass line is the antidote to that. Because it's on the beat. Challenge yourself wherever you're at to, to keep those half notes going. I'm going to some other changes. I'm really challenging. And what's fun about practicing like this too is then when you just kind of open it up and don't worry about the restrictions. You're free, but now you've got some ideas. sounds like what it feels like That's bass lines. That's the how and the why. It's just the beginning, but I hope it reinvigorated you guys this week to um, want to explore in some bass lines. A lot of ideas there. That's really, I mean, in many ways, that's months of possible practice over these different styles. So think about this as kind of an overview. You don't have to do all this for next week. This is just the beginning, but the main thing to circle back to where we started in terms of why we're doing this um, is to get that independence of the hands going. That's the process that we're practicing. If you can commit to every day doing something, and, and the great thing is there's all these different styles to do. You can start wherever. You can start on the Stevie Wonder stuff, the Herbie Hancock, the blues, wherever you want, because it's that process of practicing the independence of the hands in a simplified, isolated, but yet creative and, and always listening kind of a way 
that's going to just really, I think, supercharge your thinking and what the left hand can do. Okay? So thank you guys so much. As always, happy practicing. All right, what's up, YouTube? That's, that's, that's how we do it. That's the lesson. Um, if you just joined us, you're like, what is going on? It's like a lesson within a lesson. It's like those Russian wooden dolls. There's, you pull it out and there's another thing. That's the lesson from beginning to end. And um, thank you guys for being here. I'm going to take some questions because I saw a bunch coming by. Uh, and thank you guys for that. Uh, maybe we'll just take a few minutes to go through that. Anything? Oh, let me just say. So this is jazz piano method, like I say. I do a lesson like this every week, not live usually. We just do that every month or two. Um, but it's one lesson per week. We're going to have a bunch of transcription. Max is going to have fun on this one. Uh, be some nice stuff on there. Um, and then we present it on the site with some other resources, you know, as needed. And if you're interested in this, we're doing a special offer. You know how we do it. If Ian is, oh, that, there it is. I see it right there. 50% off all of our piano courses. Oh, right, the piano access pass. Right, so the way that you get access to Jazz Piano Method, if you want to see this every week, and maybe more importantly, see, see the archive, like, I mean, I've covered so many tunes. If there's a tune you're interested in, I've probably done a lesson on it. Um, but the way to do that is through the Piano Access Pass, which is cool because it gives you the whole archive, the new lesson every week, um, like this one. But it also gives you all of Adam Manis' course. Who? Adam Manis. Um, the Magic Voicing System. And it's an ongoing situation. And the 50% off is great because um, that's our biggest, that's like the Black Friday kind of situation. So we're just kind of bringing that in as a special today. And also Open Studio Pro, which is coming at the beginning of next year, um, being part of Piano Access Pass, that's going to be your only way to get access to this deeper community. More on that to come soon. But this would be a great time to really, the way to do this is to get your annual plan 50% off today for Piano Access Pass. Then you're taken care of for all of next year for, I think, all of your practicing and inspiration needs. And new lesson every week like this. So even if it isn't there now, new things to inspire you. So that's the sales pitch. Please consider joining. It's like Netflix. You know what I'm saying? But better. Well, I think it's better. Anyway, let's, uh, let me go ahead with just a couple questions. And I apologize. I don't know how far back I can go. If you have questions about the offer, too, feel free to drop those. And Ian from Team Open Studio will let you know. He probably will show up as Open Studio. Um, and thank you for the super chats. I saw a couple of you. I'm sorry that they flew by so fast. That's really kind of you. Much appreciated. Um, your overhead camera you're using, what kind of camera? Um, that's good. I've been talking baseline so much. This is a Panasonic either G4 or G5. I can't tell. We've got both of them. We use a lot of Panasonic cameras in here. I like them a lot. I've learned a lot about them. They're super fussy. They're not like, you know, your phone. They're hard to get look right. Like your phone, you just pull out and take a picture and it's going to look really good. These can look even better, of course, but there's a lot of there's a lot of things that go into making it look right, especially the white balance. And I don't know how we did today. What we try to do is to get the keys to be the same color on that as that um, and as the overhead and the main shot, you know. So that's like white balancing. We're manually white balancing. We're, I, I'm, we, me, because I'm the only one in here, manually focusing and stuff. But yeah, the camera is uh, Panasonic, and it's got a really good fixed lens, no autofocus or anything because the autofocus is convenient, but it just doesn't look as good. So this is like some kind of a, I can't remember what kind it is, but it's a really nice lens. Um, cool. Let's see other questions we're gonna do just for a minute. Thanks for the great lesson. Thank you, Bruce. And thanks, Rich. This is a million dollar lesson. Wow, I'll take that. Not bad. Senior, oh yeah, Senior Blues has an amazing, is that? Oh, what is it? Uh, Or silver, it's got, I think I'm messing up that bass line actually, but it's something like that. A song from my father. Yeah, Horace Silver has a bunch of great, um, great bass lines. Photographia, exactly, that's what it was, Joe Beam. Thank you guys for doing that. Um, yes, we're, this is being recorded. Um, keep that right hand simple until you can do it more. Yep, Joe's got my back. Joe knows what's up. Uh, Okay, Gary's asking, how can I keep the time without being distracted by the right hand? Um, that's the million dollar question. How can I keep time? So this is like when you're kind of 
crossing over that threshold or the Rubicon um, is from when you're practicing with just your left hand. The question is like, what can you practice that is just challenging enough that you have to concentrate on solidifying that left hand so that you can start to trust it to become automated. Um, and the way to do this is just very disciplined and gradual practice. So if I'm doing, um, first of all, you got to get that line going, that bass line where it's grooving and you, you can do it. You don't have to be able to talk, but you just have to be able to play it. And then it's like, what's the simplest thing you can add in rhythmically with this so that it won't distract? Whole notes. And if the chord's too much, just single note. But we're not into independence yet, right? So then you gotta go something that's in between. You hear that? I'm going on the upbeat. End of one. So that's harder than it sounds. And that's actually the end of the 16th note, end of one. I should clarify because we're going slow meter. Um, but that's, you just have to go that slowly by adding in something that's going to challenge you. Because as you do that, you're training that left hand to be able to survive a little bit more on its own. And it's gradual. And it's definitely the kind of thing you'll practice and it'll be like, you might practice just that for an hour and be like frustrated, like, I didn't get any better. I'm still messing it up. Move on to something else. When you come back tomorrow, I think, and you kind of jump in that, but start simple again. Don't start on something harder than that with that simple one note addition. You'll start to see, oh, something kind of seeped into my ears and my hands overnight. This is definitely the kind of area that, even away from the instrument, you're going to start to see some improvements if you put in that discipline time. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. There he is, David Hernandez. Thank you for the super chat, brother. I uh, really appreciate that. Super kind of you. Um, do you practice these bass lines? This is from Richard. Do you practice these bass lines with a metronome or do you rely on your internal clock? So now I'm, I pretty much, and I practice this stuff, you guys, know it. I, I don't just preach it, I live it. Like this is some of my favorite stuff to practice. Um, I mostly uh, use the internal clock. I do occasionally pull out the metronome. I've always got the Franz right here. Big shout out to the Franz company. I don't even know if that's like a company that exists anymore, but <laughs> this is old school, you know. It's always here and it's always ready to go. Um, I don't practice it a lot, but I do. I mean, I'll probably at least once a week pull that out to practice and specifically over something like this. I would, I, I would say for everybody, until you feel like your rhythm is rock solid, practice with the metronome a lot. Now, this is controversial, so your mileage may vary. I know Chicory has a whole other concept and I defer to Chick. For me, I practice with the metronome. I, I know a lot of great musicians that have great time that practice a lot with the metronome. And I know some that didn't. So I don't know that it's necessarily necessary, but it's like anything. Like, can you get to be like really bulked up? Not like me, super not bulked up, but like real muscles and like bodybuilder healthy without weights, just using your body? Yes. Can you do it easier with weights? Yes. So it's, you know, it just sort of depends on what you have access to and, and how you want to look at it, I think. Um, Sandy's Blues, exactly. That's what that was. Uh, tell about the way you play, whether legato or non-legato, where is accent? So um, for the bass lines, when you're walking a bass line, I'm not going to have time to go through every kind of bass line, of course, but walking for bass line, which is probably the most common, um, I like to think about them as even quarter notes and legato, but not super legato. So it's not like, you know, it's, but it's not. Think about the way a bass plays. You know, it's like doom, doom. it's ringing, but it's articulated each note. And then in terms of the accent, I think that I, I think it's best to practicing and play them, thinking about even accents on all four with just the slightest accent on two and four. So it's not. Basically the way a really good bass player plays. Like if you think about it, it's almost like feathering the bass drum. It's like if you think about it and can just barely feel it, that accent on two and four, that's enough because that propels that line forward. Now how you like to play your bass line, just like a bass player or a pianist or whatever, that's going to be individual. But to practice it as a starting point, I think that's a good place, just the slightest 
slightest little accent, not a written accent or anything, just ding, 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 like almost not an accent, like an emphasis, if that makes sense. All right, I'm going to do one more question, you guys, and then I'm going to do a bad thing, which is jump down to the bottom and see if there's any questions. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but um, my son is 14 years old, and he also plays, but when he started with jazz, he was sold. His Spotify playlist changed completely from pop to jazz. I'm overjoyed. Oh, that wasn't a question. That's just a great comment, uh, like Nina Simone. Oh, Nina Simone, I'm such a fan of you guys that have been with me for a while know what a fan I am of Nina Simone's piano playing. Uh, everybody knows her amazing vocals and songwriting and just as, a, as, a, as an icon. But uh, I think her piano playing, I think she's one of the greatest piano players in the jazz, blues, and rhythm and blues pop music ever. Yes, her left, I mean, her control. And, and talk about hand independence. Um, now, I'm sure from a lot of, you know, she practiced a lot of classical repertoire. I mean, that was really like her thing from when she was very young. And so a lot of that, that literature and repertoire, you still got to put in the work, but it's kind of like made to lead you to the promised land of, finger, of hand independence. Um, a lot of the great classical repertoire, for sure. So that's always an area to go to. Um, I missed the name of the Herbie Hancock tune we were practicing. Chameleon. This, now, this is a good one to practice with the metronome, for sure. That's a really good one. Let me just show you guys that, because I could already feel myself lacking some precision on that. So I would definitely be like, I think around... What, what is that, 90 or something? Boo do no, a little fast. 100. That's hard. That's hard stuff, especially when you put it with the metronome, because the metronome doesn't lie. Um, so that's definitely a good one to pull out the metronome. So there you go. Uh, do I have a lesson on all blues? I'm sure I do. I'm 99% sure. If I don't, please somebody let me know, and I'm gladly going to do that one next week. I, I know I did. I'll probably do another one soon because I, I don't think I've done it in a while. And the funny thing is about doing these lessons, Jazz Piano Method, for nine years, like I've actually gotten better over these years. Not like, not as much better as I got from like, say, age... 12 to 21 like that was a bigger improvement i'm sure those nine years but i do look back on some of the early lessons and um realize i've gotten a little better G, that's a good bass line. Is that what it is? No, it's not an E. It must be. I don't know what key it's in. Um, that's a good one for sure. Um, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate it. I hope that you guys have a wonderful end of 2020, a wonderful Christmas, if that's your thing. Um, whatever you celebrate, I think mainly just let's celebrate humanity. Let's celebrate 2021 being a year where we have... Uh, more happiness, more music, less loss of life, and, you know, just um, being able to come back together in person. But let's stay spiritually connected even as we're still apart because uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so, um, you know, music is a great place to do that work. So let's keep going uh, and staying strong. And I hope you guys stay safe. And I hope that you're, you know, with loved ones. And if you can't be safely with loved ones, love them from afar. There's nothing wrong with that either, you know. Um, a lot of times we think, oh, I can't get together for the Christmas thing. And that's great. Make those smart decisions. But you can still be together. Get on the phone. Get on the Zoom. Get on something. Or just send those vibes out there and let's all come together. And um, tonight, we'd like to invite you, Adam Annis and I, if you're new here, or even if you're not new, you're invited no matter what, but you might not know about this. At 8 p.m. Eastern Time tonight, which is just in a few hours, I believe, we're going to be listening to... Very topical, the Nutcracker Suite by Duke Ellington. And this is such a cool piece. And I've actually played this before. Uh, I'll tell my story about it tonight. But it's such a great piece. It sounds like it's going to be so corny. 
and it's just so brilliant. I think it's some of Duke Ellington's great writing. I mean, all his stuff is great, um, and the Nutcracker is the Nutcracker, which is fantastic, but people love this piece. People love the original, so it's going to be fun. We're going to listen to that. We do a little listening sesh. Just have a little drink and uh, listen communally. So join us right here on Open Studio, uh, this very same YouTube channel. And if you like this video, if you learned something today, how about pressing that thumbs up button because that helps us spread the word to other people that might enjoy these kinds of videos. So all you gotta do is smash the button. You can join Open Studio too, but at a minimum, smash the like button and subscribe because we're going live all the time, a lot of great free content. And remember, what is it, 50% off today only on the all access, no, the piano access pass, link below. Um, and that's gonna be our biggest thing of the sale of the year. So get on board with that and then you'll be all set for next year and all the wonderful things we have coming. Thank you for being here. Peace, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. See you tonight.